But I don't think there's an, anything inherently problematic about putting up the PEX tubing except uh, the potential for divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Unless that's what you're going for. I mean, it depends on what you're going for. Yeah. I mean, he already loves his cat more than he loves his kids. <laughs> Welcome to the Find Known Building Podcast, a weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Deputy Editor Matt Milham. What's up? Kylie Jacques, Design Editor. Hello. And Jeff Rose, Producer. Hey there. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, we got some good feedback from the last uh, episode. Uh, Doug Horgan, who we know from his article in Fine Home Building, and his, uh, which was on surface protection and, or job site protection, uh, they run a top-notch design build firm in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and he wrote in uh, with regard to our discussion of building a shower in a masonry constructed building, a mass wall. And uh, he said, regarding a tiling a shower next to an uninsulated masonry wall, we have solved that with foam-based tile backer board, which works its insulation and tile support in one. The first time we needed this solution, the bath was in a condo and we were down to fractions of an inch to meet code. And we knew, knew the clients would be uncomfortable if we didn't get insulation into the assembly. So instead of furring out the wall, which is what we suggested in the show. I wasn't on that one, I don't think. So you're not taking any responsibility. No, I wouldn't either. Didn't listen Were you to on it. that one? I have no I idea what happened. Talking about yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> so uh, they just put this foam-backed tile board, right, mm -hmm. and, and right up against the wall, which seems like a very elegant solution to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Sch Schluter's curdy board and Weddy's building panels are both over our point four point three per inch, as you'd expect from foam. Both come in half inch and two inch thicknesses, and both can be built up even thicker if needed, or layered over conventional foam uh, insulation. And code, uh, code zone six, masonry walls, mass walls insulated on the interior require R13 to meet prescriptive code. It's 17 in climate zone five, 20 in climate zone six, but goes down to six in climate zone two. Obviously, there are a number of ways to meet code besides using the prescriptive chart, and code is not necessarily the right number for comfort in a shower where you're standing naked in front of the entire surface. So these numbers are just a starting point. That's a, I mean, that's a really good point. Yeah. Like, if you want one place in your house to be warmer than the rest, I'd say your shower is a good start. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. Um, one trick you can do with curdy board is to use fasteners on the first layer and then use thin set to attach the face layer. That way no fasteners go through the entire insulation layer to make cold spots. But I'm not sure how important that is. Seems like a good tip. It's freaking awesome. We should add that to the tips department. Agreed. <laughs> So I put some links to both Schluter's, Schluter's product and Weddy's product up there that Doug uses. And thanks to you, Doug, for that helpful advice. I think that is the best solution I've heard to this problem. Matt? I don't know. Thoughts? <laughs> How to pronounce Weddy. Weddy. It's Oh, is it Veddy? Veddy. Veddy, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've always heard it said Weddy here. But yeah, who Weddy, Weddy, Veddy. I think it's German. They're all German. I like... <laughs> <laughs> I like that's what you fixated on yeah. the whole thing, right? <laughs> Anytime there's a German word, Matt jumps on it. Uh, okay, so uh, we also heard from Taylor. He, we, this was in response to our discussion about heat pump water heaters. We asked her feedback from folks who had them install them, and we asked what they thought. So Taylor says, I, I recently made the switch from a 1994 electric water heater to a 50-gallon ream heat pump water heater. And the first month, my utility bill dropped 50 bucks. Uh, it's a smart water heater that allows me to track usage as well as control the temperature from my phone. Uh, now, see, that is something I would want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Turn down the heat when it's taking a shower. <laughs> <laughs> Liam, you've been in there too long. Yeah. Out. Uh, from July 27th to December 31st, it used 258 kilowatt hours at nine cents a kilowatt hour. For $23.24 total. <laughs> this is my kind of guy, right? I live in Wisconsin. It's a in a conditioned basement and is set to heat pump only mode. Uh, it's a family of three, and we've never had any issues with it. So I think that's very interesting. Yeah. A real world scenario. Yeah. In a cold environment. Yeah. It makes me think I should have given more thought to replacing my water heater. So we, we did wet. talk about this, and, right. your, and your guy didn't even suggest this as an that's, option. That's, I think, the, how we started talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Although, I have one nice thing to say about that situation. What's that? I've only spent $100 so far. He told me I could pay in installments, and 
That's the last I heard of him. One installment. And then... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not complaining. He's going to come he some evening and take that water heater out of your yeah. basement. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a repo man for water heaters? Uh, <laughs> I think she's about to find out. Oh, uh, man. Okay, who is this? This is uh, Mark. Uh, Mark says, uh, howdy, FHB podcast team. Back in episode 210, a listener asked about protecting rigid, rigid insulation at or below grade. We're building a home using ICFs and have encountered the same issue. Well, the reason he's encountered this is because ICFs are made out of polystyrene, right? Um, and so we've been looking around, and I found a great-looking option in a video from Hammer in Hand. Uh, they talk about what are what are called Finex panels at uh, in this video that he linked us to, um, and they're made from fiber cement, and uh, they kind of look like fiber cement panels alike to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not remarkable in any way, which I think is what you kind of want, want from this yeah. Si situation, right? Yeah, they look good. Yeah. Uh, he says. Uh, Okay, Phoenix panels are rated for ground contact with a limited lifetime warranty against delamination. I'd love to go this route, but at about 160 bucks per sheet, that's a 4 by 8 sheet, quarter 8 inch thickness, uh, plus shipping from Canada, it's a little too spendy. If you have the budget, it might be a good solution for you. So, so he's looking at an alternative project, a product called Groundbreaker from Nudo, or more typical parts coat, which is like, uh, what, uh, Portland cement and sand, right? Yeah. <clears throat> That's something that Martin Holiday recommended in a list of 10 options. So we'll put that yeah. article up. Do you want to paraphrase what the... There's so many. What What did you like as a designer? Um, I can't say. I was I hadn't thought about it in those terms. I think it depends on the cost, right? You'd have to look all them up to, yeah. to know what they would look like, you know? So the, the parts code of, uh, you know, cementatious plaster is... Mm -hmm. is it seems like a good solution to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the groundbreaker panels, I was curious what they look like, but the website didn't have any photographs, which I found a little <laughs> concerning. Um, yeah. and, and it had some like really, really bogus copy written to go with it. It said, like, this protects your foundation. And given that the rest of your house is bearing on the foundation, protecting it is important. And I think the foundation is not the problem. Yeah, the foundation <laughs> is, like, the only thing in the house you could probably ram a car right. into. Right. Like <laughs> have it pretty much come away. So I was kind of turned scheme. off by that, as yeah. I often am. Some, some companies think that those kind of marketing materials are not important, that the product should sell itself. But when you make claims like that, I am immediately uh, skeptical of whatever it is you're selling. Yeah. I asked a builder I know, Randy Wilson, about that what he would do in that situation. And he uses metal coil stock bent yeah. to the profile. But he said that the durability of that is an it issue. It dense easily. Yeah. Yeah. Like that and it oil cans. And, yeah. Yeah. Can you tell folks what oil cans means? Yeah. So when it heats up and cools down. It gets it wrinkly. It expands and contracts. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, if you've, however you've attached it, you know, can really affect that too. But mm -hmm. I, th I think this problem is still waiting for what I would describe as the perfect solution. I, I have not seen anything that's the perfect solution. I would be inclined to insulate on the inside just because of this problem, even though it's less desirable, right? You'd like that concrete to be working in your favor as thermal mass, you know? Yeah. What about cement backer board? So that, to me, that's what this Finex panel Same looks idea. like. Looks, yeah. Yeah. Like regular tile backer, I've heard of people using that and then putting like uh, veneer self-adhered stone on there, but it's not made for that. Yeah, a lot of them aren't <laughs> rated for outdoor yeah. use is mm -hmm. the problem. So. They're going to blow up when they get wet. Yeah. So there we go. Um, well, <laughs> I want to focus on something that Mark didn't even ask us about, okay? So he says... Um, I've been trying to sort all the details for our new home as an owner builder, and it's been a big challenge and several of your podcasts have been very helpful. Being off grid brings up a whole new set of constraints, particularly regarding power. For example, air sealing will be critical for reducing heat requirement, but running an ERV or HRV 24 seven is not viable to, to the lack of our winter sun to provide power. So he's obviously using photovoltaic panels and you need sunlight to have juice. Mm -hmm. I plan to monitor indoor air quality to control ventilation to minimize the required power. We want to use cordwood and a radiant system to provide more consistent temperature than a typical wood stove. But again, power for the combustion blower and the boiler and the circulator pump or pumps is a big deal. 
that key in my mind is to minimize the key in my mind is to minimize the boiler runtime with heat storage in a tight, well insulated building envelope. So far, I've gotten quite an education. It will be interesting to see how it works out. So I can't help but make a comment about this that mm -hmm. if you live in an off grid house, you cannot have uh, a, an appliance that relies on electricity. Right. You just you cannot. And I'm going to say, if you have a very tightly sealed house, you got to figure out the ventilation, right? Yeah, I mean, you could always open a window, but that's kind of tough when, uh, you know, there's no heat on right. and uh, <laughs> it's freezing out. It's, it's not, not the ideal solution. <laughs> so um, th the reason this comes to mind is I remembered a blog that Martin had written, and it was written by an owner builder in Canada who had made the same mistake mm -hmm. uh, with regard to putting a boiler with a circulator pump in their, um, their off-grid house, right? Uh, the big problem with our heating system was that it was relatively complex and brittle. We weren't there all the time to run the wood stove, meaning the boiler really needed to carry the load. The problem is the system requires a constant and quite significant supply of electricity at the time of year when it is most difficult to generate power from our photovoltaic array. Um, hmm. Running full power, the heating system requires approximately 400 watts of electricity for the boiler and circulation pumps, meaning that if it runs for 10 hours a day, which happens on the coldest days of the winter, the heating system alone needs 4, 000, or 4 kilowatts, 4,000 kilowatt hours, right? Mm -hmm. 4 kilowatt hours, mm -hmm. 4,000 Watts. Watts. Or hours. Watt hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, almost the full amount of our daily target of electricity. So that's assuming you're going to have a sunny day right. and get all the power that your system can produce. And that seems unrealistic all the time. The other problem is the hydronic system is sensitive to freezing, which occurred last winter, our first full winter. We lost power and we had a few frozen water pipes as well as a break in one of the hydronic heating lines. There was glycol in the mix as an antifreeze, but apparently the installer did not put enough in, and there's good reason not to use a whole bunch of antifreeze in your uh, heating system because it, it, it does have some trade-offs. Um, it did take a very serious set of combined circumstances to bring down the house. It was the coldest week of the year while we were away visiting family at Christmas. Several days of snow covered the solar panels and prevented any electricity from being generated. And finally, the last straw, that generator broke down. Oh, man. So, um, <laughs> Sounds terrible. A perfect storm of, yeah. you know, ruptured pipes mm -hmm. leading to ruptured pipes. So, uh, Mark... I would really rethink your plan to put in a hydronic system. Uh, probably the best thing to do is to rely on a wood stove, and a lot of people use um, what we used to call in Vermont monitor heaters, which are wall furnaces powered by propane or kerosene or heating oil. And uh, some of them work without electricity. Uh, that's what you want. <laughs> yeah. They make cool little ones for, like, tiny houses. Yes. And if you have a big house, you just put more than one in, right? Yeah. Heat the rooms you're using. Uh, and they're not terribly expensive. They are unattractive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why do they project out of the wall or something? It's a big steel box yeah. with, like, a grill on it, mm -hmm. right? It's There's no hiding it. There's no hiding it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're allowed to because it needs, right. you know, clearance from combustibles. Sure. And But it's very reliable and works when your photovoltaic system is not. Mm. This is my favorite thing that we heard. Yeah, this is a pretty funny one. This is from Jeremy. Uh, my 2017 Silverado radio ended up displaying an unfortunate but humorous oh. <laughs> title to the latest podcast episode. <laughs> Thought I would share it with the FHB podcasters. Keep up the great episodes and racy titles. So what does it say, Kylie? Not ass. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I love Justin's response to that. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it was a, an odd assortment of uh, b building envelope assemblies, right, or something like that. And, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, the radio abbreviated it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. I've been called worse, too. Um, so I don't want to talk about home products projects today because I don't have any to talk about. Same. What do you got? <laughs> well, I painted a pony wall. And What's a pony wall? Oh, short wall. Short wall. Yeah. And it had been primed for over a year, so finally did that. Felt, cool. Felt good about it, but as I was doing it, I was kind of thinking about how you get used to... I had been looking at this primed wall. You quit wall. noticing you stuff. Start notice, yeah, you stop noticing things, and then when you start noticing things, it's sort Everything of like... Everything else looks like crap. It's making you crazy, <laughs> and then I just sat back and thought, for all these things that need to be done, I need to remind myself that I'm just very grateful to have a roof over my head. 
my dad said to me one time, uh, shortly after we bought our first house was like, you have your entire lifetime to work on houses. Mm -hmm. So I try and keep that in mind and you will need it. I, (laughs) it's so true. And a very limited budget. (laughs) So, um, T, uh, wrote to us and he had a suggestion for a, a conversation, uh, starter. And, uh, I'm going to do that in our little project time. So, uh, he says, uh, should you change a water heaters anode ro- rod or not? And, um, uh, well, let's go around the room. Uh, have you ever changed your anode rod, Jeff? I have not. Matt, have you changed your anode rod ever? I've never had a water heater. <laughs> so no. <laughs> Kylie, have you changed your anode rod? I wouldn't know where to look for it. Um, so maybe we should tell folks what yes. an anode rod Let's is. Let's start with that. So uh, an, a sacrificial anode is put in the tank of tank style water heaters, and it's meant to corrode before the, the tank does. It's, uh, I believe, zinc. Okay. Um, and you put it in there, and um, somehow the electrons like want to corrode that rather than the, the tank because hmm. I think it's easier to, for them to corrode if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That's cool. What, am I right on this, Matt? Is my yeah, it's basically, yeah, it's just a thing that, it, yeah, it, it will attack that before it attacks other stuff, but then it will basically run out eventually and then it'll start Which corroding other stuff. So, you so yeah. So, so if, they tell you to replace it. Yeah. I don't think I've ever met anyone who has. <laughs> uh, but how, how would you? How do you access it? I'm not really clear on how oh, to get so inside Oh, so that's a good it. question. So on the top of the tank is usually like a hex fitting, okay. right? It's like a plug, mm-hmm. and you unscrew it, and the thing comes out. I can only imagine how easy it is to get that plug after it's been in the you know water heater for half a dozen yeah. years, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but so what would what would you recommend for time frame for changing it out? Well, so that's the that's the good question. So, I asked um, somebody who knows more about this than me, mm-hmm. which would be just about everybody, um, <laughs> except us. Mar- Mike Lombardi of he's a plumber in Danbury. We talk about Mike all the time. He's one of the smartest people I know. Uh, he says I've installed. Um, so here's I asked him originally about like so one of the solutions to the problem of tanks corroding are plastic tanks and I know there's a company Marathon that makes this and he 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 said he had not installed one of those but he had installed this other brand Hubble which are heat pump hybrid electric water heater heaters um, Hubble has special tapping and alloys and a hydrostone proprietary cement lining that is super resistant to corrosion they guarantee long tank life without an anode. Anodes can be tricky and troublesome. Sometimes they'll produce offensive odors. So hmm. that's something I hadn't heard. I can't remember the last time I was sniffing around my water tank. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes your water stink. Sm- it's, okay. It's like smells like rotten eggs. That makes more sense. Yeah. I've heard that the way to solve that is just to raise the temperature of the w- tank, and that'll often solve that, and hmm. that's been my experience in the past. Uh, I also asked him, like, what do what last longer... Uh, oil-fired or gas-fired tanks or electric uh, resistance tanks. And he said, electric water heaters generally outlast gas and oil-fired tanks. The direct blast of fossil fuel combustion creates more stress, fatigue, and chemical reaction than a passive electric heating element. <clears throat> poor water quality coupled with a lack of maintenance routinely lead to poor per- performance and premature death of water heaters. Um, your reader will benefit and save energy if they are, uh, choose to change the, the anode and drain the tank regularly i think they say once a year to get the sediment out of it Hmm. so jeff have you drained your water heater to get the sediment out of it ever i have actually matt have you drained your i I have flushed my boiler yes yes and you have to put some kind of acid in there presumably i don't know i haven't done that you just pump water through it yeah okay kylie have you drained sediment from your water heater no this is the first time i've dealt with a water heater so I did that once by accident because I had to replace a thermostat, and uh, so all the sediment came out, and yeah, that's what I, that's what I did. Yeah. And when there was I, still tons of stuff in there. That's what I noticed. I, I'm sure it was sand from my well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I flushed mine, it, it, my boiler, a lot of gross-looking stuff came out. A lot of black stuff. I don't know what it was. You don't want to know what that was. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I deal with a lot of black stuff coming up from my drain in my tub. Isn't it? What is that stuff? Wasn't that's, it rust? Oh, in the boiler? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, more than likely. Yeah. Yeah. Could have been stuff Mike's that's going to tell us that that's not rusted water something too. else. I yeah, it, it might have just been sediment that was getting carried up, making it past the filter and getting in. I really don't know. I don't think my f- sediment filter does squat is what I think. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you change that regularly? Yeah. yeah, I have to, or the shower makes a horrible, like, whistling noise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hmm. 
I think it's probably because it's starting from for pressure, right? Yeah. <laughs> So our first question today, so uh, those of you out there, uh, please tell us if you change your anode. I would like to know. Tell me how you do it, where you get the anode. Uh, I always wondered how you get it back in the tank because the things are like nor almost as long as the tank is, but they, the replacement ones they sell have a, like they're hinged. They bend. Oh, okay. Right, because so you, can you can't. The ceiling. You, right, yeah, right. the ceiling yeah. is in the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the old one, it, when it comes out, is gone, so... Uh, that's not a problem. Right. It's consumed. Hmm. So the, the, sorry, the question from uh, it, Vanessa is a first. This, this is our first Instagram question, I believe, funneled to us from uh, Rob Watsack. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, Vanessa asks, we renovated our, ent our entire house ourselves, including removal of all the drywall. When we put the drywall back up, we had a family friend give us advice on how to tape the joints. He recommended fiberglass tape. After some time, this joint started cracking. Our neighbor is a project manager for another large construction company, and when we told him about the cracking, he sent over one of his drywall guys to help us fix it. Those guys had to sand the walls a little, and then they just paper taped over the fiberglass tape. That was a whole other issue. Their work involved tape bubbles, etc. We finally got everything all repaired, and it looked great. We're talking months of work at this point. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we primed and painted it, and we now have cracks in the painted ceiling. We have an industrial sander that worked great for sanding the walls without paint, but now even the heaviest grit sander paper, sandpaper gets gunked up immediately. Uh, it sounds like the best option now will be to dig out all the fiberglass tape and the paper tape, sand what we can to rough up the surface a bit, take down the edges, then TSP to wipe it all down before reapplying paper tape alone and feathering it out. These people must be so sick of this situation. <laughs> yeah. Awful. Uh, any tips on how to patch drywall on level five finished walls that has already been painted? Using an industrial sander with rough grit sandpaper is just gumming up sandpaper immediately. Can I put drywall mud over painted surfaces? Any primer required to this? Thank you tons for any advice you can give. Well, so first of all, we should talk about what a level five finished wall is, right, for those folks who don't know. Do you want to take a stab at that? Really flat. <laughs> <laughs> It's an extra drywall step, right? Yeah. So you skim coat after you've taped everything, feathered out all your seams, then you go over the entire wall with a skim coat and then. And the skim coat nice. can be applied a number of ways. Uh, yeah. our, our friend Myron Ferguson puts it on with a roller sometimes, which mm -hmm. kind of really upsets our Facebook followers. Really? <laughs> <laughs> why? What would be preferred? I don't know why they're so irate about that, but they, they hate it. <laughs> um, the, mo the best way I've seen for a whole house is to get surfacing primer uh, sprayed with a big honking spray gun by somebody who knows what they're doing, and that's that's a great way. Sounds a lot easier, too. Yeah, so there's an article I'll put up on the f podcast page from uh, Philip Hansel that describes that process that we ran a few years ago in fine home building. Um, what other ways? You can use a ta uh, mud knife, right? I've, yeah. I've done it by, so you do... Uh, a stripe, leave a space, do another stripe, and then the next time you go back and fill in the, the stripes where you didn't. That way you don't get ridges and stuff with the mud, and that works pretty good. Hmm. That's clever. Oh, man. I, you I got got put so, that on the tips I page, too. I so many tips. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not leaving much. Mm -hmm. It's, Super it's just the tiniest amount. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and what it does is it uh, makes the porosity of the drywall and the compound and the paper the same because now you have compound everywhere. It looks right. super nice. Yeah. Nice even. Uh, anyway, so what do we do about this problem drywall here? <sighs> I think it sucks any way about it. Yeah. There's, no <laughs> There's nothing good about this. Yeah. I mean, that they have all these like repeated cracking problems makes me think that maybe the stuff isn't secured properly. That's a very with. good possibility. And I wonder if they didn't overdrive the screws when they were hanging it. If these aren't, you know, if these people aren't professional drywall hangers, yep. I didn't watch some of Myron's videos or, right. <laughs> so, you know, look at some other resources first. It's very easy to overdrive a drywall screw. Um, so I think once you're done digging out all that tape, because I think you are probably going to have to do that. Oh, yeah. Um, check all those joints, especially along all those cracks, and make sure that everything is secured right. And if it's not, you're going to have to go add some screws. Um, Very good suggestion. And then I would redo Do it all again. <laughs> yeah. 
I hate fiberglass joint tape. When I was a young man, I used it on a few projects because uh, it doesn't bubble. And until you get pretty proficient with paper tape and learn how to thin mud so it sticks really well, uh, you in inevitably have some bubbles. Mm -hmm. And uh, that solves that problem, but it comes with a whole bigger set of problems along with that solution. Yeah, it's much more likely to crack. Yeah. And you're supposed to using use it with setting tight mud, and I can almost guarantee that these folks uh, did not do that. Yeah. Um, so setting type compounds, for those of you listening who don't know, dry chemically rather than by drying. So there's some kind of what uh, lime is probably some some component of it, right? I would guess. Yeah. I don't know. I've only used it one time on your recommendation. <laughs> it's fantastic. I love the stuff. Yeah. Until you have to sand it, then it's awful. Uh, <laughs> But the easy sand version is actually not too bad. But normal Durabon, uh, which is a harder material, that is like sanding cement. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you got to redo all this, I think. And yeah. I'm sorry to say that, but maybe it's I think worth, they probably knew that. Uh, maybe it's worth hiring a drywall finisher because mm -hmm. you don't want to do this a third time. Right. Yeah. Or a fourth time. Are we in the third or fourth time? Yeah. Third. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, for the ceiling, it doesn't sound like they touched the ceiling before. I don't know. What about that? like really wide fiber fuse. Have you ever used that or seen that? I, I, I'm I familiar with that, and I've used the joint tape, which is fantastic, uh, yeah. which is... So when we talk about fiberglass tape, there's like a mesh, mm -hmm. right? Fiberglass mesh, and then there's fiber fuse, which is a non-woven material, and yep. it's great in every way, Yeah. except for inside corners. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Cuts really easy yeah, with, with a utility drywall knife. knife. <laughs> or a, yeah, drywall knife, because yeah. they're sharp. Yeah, you'll go right through it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they make a wide product that's made for fixing walls that plaster have a lot of cracks walls, right? in them. I think it's mostly probably for plaster walls. So you'd walls, put this over the whole ceiling? That's what I'm wondering. I mean, <gasps> it, does it seem like... <laughs> I almost said a bad word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you could, you know, apply <laughs> the compound with a roller, a paint put roller. Put this in there. Embed this, and then... But you're still yeah. experimenting, right? Like, Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm not... Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying for them to do it. I would definitely hire a pro, because that... I, you know, Didn't they're, you're, they're already outside of their, like, it's clear that they don't have the skills to well, get so it done, they, I would say. They might have them by now because <laughs> yeah. this is the third time they've done this. <laughs> yeah. How did you treat, didn't you replace your ceiling? Yeah. Oh, well ceiling? Uh-huh. And, and I ripped was the entire method? thing down. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you weren't trying It looked to like things. the inside of, like, a carnival tent. Mm -hmm. Like, because it was three-eighths <laughs> inch drywall. Mine's starting to look a little that way, too. <laughs> yeah, it was 70 so it was years saggy. old. It, yeah, it, was, mm -hmm. it basically was sagging between all the joists, so... I can't think down. of a worse way to try and save money. Than what? Tearing it using, down? No, using three-eighths <laughs> drywall on the ceiling. Like, yeah. what were they thinking? I don't know, and they had half-inch on the walls. It makes no sense. It really was bizarre. It I have no, no idea. Sense. Yeah. Some people won't put half inch on the on the ceiling. They'll put only five eighths up there. Mm. Yeah, I I think that's overkill, but I see why people do it. Yeah, it's a better sound uh, blocker, right? If you have living space bedrooms above, it's, mm -hmm. it's yeah. better at stopping sound. All those mice scurrying around up there to block that. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking in a two story house, but yeah. I get what you're saying. No, so I. Uh, I you can definitely apply tape and joint compound to painted surfaces. It tends to bubble, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a pain. Yeah. But you can kind of reduce that with some 60-grit uh, sandpaper. Uh, it tends to reduce that a little bit, i found. But um, you sand the bubbles down, and then probably by the second or third coat, it's it's less of an issue. But it's 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 crappy all the way around to have to fix this much drywall. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, Vanessa. Vanessa, I don't have your address. So you're going to have to send that to me if you want a sticker. Maybe you don't want to ever hear from us again, so that's also <laughs> fine. Um, we also heard from, uh, this is from Greg from Cazadero, California. Does anyone know if I'm saying that correctly? Cazadero? Nope. Greg, when I mispronounce your uh, city name, please uh, let me know how I should have said it. <laughs> we'll put that on the <laughs> podcast page. <laughs> Hi, guys. Love your podcast. It's been a really great, great way to expand my learning on building structures, moving from building boats to houses. There's an old boat builder saying that a house is just a leaky, upside-down boat. I'm working on a retreat center in Northern California, and the owners are adding a couple of bow roof shed cabins. So for those of you who are listening who are unfamiliar with uh, bow roof shed cabins, <laughs> I was also unfamiliar with bow roofs. Yeah, we all yeah, had, we to, look all had to look this up. <laughs> <laughs> but Jeff, you, you, you're familiar with this genre. Uh, a little bit, yeah. 
Yeah. How do you, what do you know about this? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's old, old New England thing where they would just bury boats in the... <laughs> and that, it was the the bow of the boat. I was going to say, so Sounds is it a bow charming. roof? It's a bow so- house. <laughs> bow. <laughs> yeah, are we no, pronouncing no. it wrong? Is it a bow roof? Yeah. It, I don't know. He well, spelled I mean, it like B-O-W. Like yeah. Yeah. But bow yeah, wow. yeah, it, it's bow like bow of a ship yeah. rather than bow like... German. German. Uh, you know, Sorry Walter to disappoint Gropius. you. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a bow house. It's a bow house. <laughs> it's a boat house. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there's a picture of a few up on the podcast page if you're curious what this looks like um it looks like a wishbone right Mm, that's a good description uh like a gable roof shaped like a wishbone does that make sense sure yeah you're looking at me like i'm an idiot (laughs) it looks like an upside down like hull of a yeah it looks like you just took a ship and flipped it over Mm -hmm. and that's the hull Mm -hmm. it's very cool it is yeah i'd never been introduced to this um you should book Book some time at the retreat. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty confident I can design and build the structures myself, but one thing that is puzzling me is that most of these structures have soffits that extend above the roof line so that the roof roofing needs to be defined by the soffit. I'm puzzling over the waterproof at this end joint. It's basically creating a gutter on the end, so how to appropriately flash it without just putting a rubber membrane over the whole thing. Uh, by the way, these will be heated with a small wood stove designed for Bell-style tents and be built upon a 12 by 16 freestanding deck platform with spaced deck boards. So, no, I will not be air sealing or performing blower door tests. Uh, thanks for any ideas, and thanks again for a great podcast, even if you never venture west of the Mississippi. And that's not true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys explain what he means by this soffit extending above the roof? I was line? hoping you were going to explain that to me. I can't picture it at all. I have no clue what the heck this guy's talking <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> so ordinarily, the way these things are built is the roofing like laps down over the the deck, and there's like no soffit whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So um, I think we're just having a like terminology technology pro- problem, and it mm-hmm. might be related to his boat building terminology versus home building terminology. Yeah. Uh, Do boats have soffits? <laughs> Jeff? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of, yeah. You're trying to... I don't know. <laughs> Do boats have soffits? Uh, <laughs> no idea where they even go. <laughs> Do they vent boats? Yeah. <laughs> Put a soffit in a submarine. I was like, what is the <laughs> cubic inch requirement of soffit venting for a ship? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. This is... So this is quite a project, right? Yeah. So he's building his own uh, trusses of this shape. Look, looks like using very small pieces of, like, looks like plywood, to, uh, with a top and bottom cord, and then spaced with what look like uh, what are three or four inch blocks That's to kind of make uh, like. oh, the web. Yeah. Pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I don't think it would meet snow load here, but uh, you know. Yeah. I'm guessing this is probably a mild climate. Yeah, but they probably have wind. Yeah, but it's a tent. It's not a... Yeah, except that he's going to put metal on it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the whole thing lifting up? No, I don't know if I see it. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, that's a given. I don't see it lifting up. I do see it maybe blowing over. But <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's attached to this deck, which is a permanent... A, 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 we're assuming has footings, a piers that attach uh-huh. it to the ground, right? So yeah. that's easy to solve. Yeah. Right, you just you don't want to put any structure just sitting on the ground that has walls because mm-hmm. it can blow away. Yeah, but if the entire if all the sheer strength is just coming from the fasteners that he's you know face fastening through the metal that goes into the three, <laughs> yeah, three the, rafters three, three, on each side. So I'm, I'm wondering if he, so the photo he sent shows him testing the his methods right and. They're also trying to design the space inside. So he he makes the point, which I often make, is that I like a space to work with to know how I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. So most people don't have that luxury. It has to be designed on paper. But uh, I agree with that uh, philosophy. So he might be just working this out, and then he's going to add a bunch more of these Mm -hmm. trusses. But presently, there's only three on what a structure that looks like to be at least eight feet long. Yeah. That was my impression. That he was going to make more? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then he wants to put metal roofing on this, right? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Fine. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> what about this waterproofing piece of the thing that he's asking about? So... Can you do like a cricket or something? He's, he's going to have to put underlayment under this metal roof because, as he points out, condensation is going to be an issue on cold nights, right? There's going to be someone in this tent who's breathing and it's going to like want to go up there and condense on the on the backside of the metal and then it's got to 
go be directed somewhere that is not on your guest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to sheath it, you think, first? I think so. I'm hoping. Yeah. I'm hoping. Me too. I would say that I know nothing about this uh, construction type from the, you know, just at the outset, but that's not going to prevent me from weighing in on how to build this. <laughs> <laughs> I would talk to Scandinavians where I think this originates, or you said New England. New England. Yeah. Well, we're in New England. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just take a boat and flip it over if that's what people did originally. And he's a boat builder. And he's a boat builder. He can build a boat. Make a boat. Don't discourage the guy. <laughs> uh, we're not. <laughs> we're encouraging him to do what he yeah. knows. Yeah, build a boat. <laughs> right? Yeah, build a boat, flip it over. Cock Put it. some shingles on it. You think shingles? I don't know. Asphalt? Yeah. Ugh. I think that's going to be tacky. I know. Uh, I, yeah. I hate it. But he's also talking about taking corrugated roofing and running it horizontally. You think that's a problem? I don't think it's a problem. I think it'll be fine for what these are. So he called it like a Quonset hut, but as you pointed out, and and there are, a Quonset hut is a very specific thing. Many people describe many types of buildings as Quonset huts, but they all share like an, an, an arch geometry, right? Right. Quonset huts have ribs that run vertically, mm-hmm. uh, but what I thought was a Quonset hut could have uh, horizontal corrugated metal on it too, like they used to have in uh, Gomer Pyle. I know I'm aging myself <laughs> or dating myself <laughs> and aging. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so he wants to do that. Yeah. The latter. Yeah. I mean, it, I think waterproofing those joints where the pieces overlap is not not up and down, not vertically, but where they, oh, if there's any overlaps. There's going to be because they're like two feet or 39 inches wide. So he's going to need several courses to make the, all the way from the what is the mouse of the floor all the way to the roof in this right. style of building? And, and I don't think those <laughs> joints will be a problem. But if he has any that are going, basically the joints running vertical because you've got two panels overlapping side oh, to side, essentially. My assumption would be that he would get them continuous length, and I think that would be yeah. smart. Yeah. And, I mean, if the building's only eight feet long that's going to be easy. But if he goes to, like, 24 feet right. on the next iteration, then... <laughs> it's going to be different. Then it's going to be, yeah. I don't know exactly how you would do that. A lot of roofing tar. So the one thing I've heard people complain about with uh, screw down metal roofing, like he's talking about, uh, are the exposed fasteners, and inevitably they start leaking, right? Because it's it's sealed in the old days. It used to be nails with a lead washer that sealed it to the metal, but now they're neoprene rubber and they're screws. And I think and, you can still get them nails if you wanted. Yeah, I think you can too. Yeah, um, that'd be fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's a drawback of that roofing system. But it's also like gorgeous California, so who cares? Yeah. <laughs> Once he figures it out, he'll be putting them up left and right. Well, I hope he keeps us posted on this, Greg. Mm-hmm. If you know, like I'm, I'm very curious how this is going to shake out. I, I might want to stay there. <laughs> I need a retreat. Yeah. I bet it would get so hot in those if they're in the sun with that oh, metal roofing. Yeah. I, don't know. I never it looks thought like about it's in the woods. It, it is in a, in a, a Dutch oven. Wasn't that how they, like, tormented prisoners in, in uh, World Vietnam. War II movies and oh, stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, probably. And, like, you know, you put them out in a sweat box, I think you call it, right? Mm-hmm. Getting dark, man. That would be some <laughs> retreat, right? Wouldn't that be some retreat? <laughs> to, like, Let's sweat box. box. Yeah. Sweat <laughs> torture box. Just tell them they're in Scandinavia. Yeah. It's a sauna. Yeah. That's why I think you need to go to Scandinavia, because this, this looks like a sauna to me. Yeah. I think they're the ones who can help you, <laughs> not us. Uh, Jay from Malvern, PA, writes in, um, I saw this T-Stud post on my Facebook feed today and thought it raised a very interesting question. Uh, instead of trying to debate if T-Studs are a good idea at all, has Patrick officially lost that argument at this point, by the way? Please yes. confirm. I, I have not. <laughs> um, <laughs> what if the question is, are they worth doing versus just focusing on more... a, a more external insulation? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that is the question, I think. Uh, does this make more sense than putting a layer of foam on the outside or mineral wool? And I don't think so. And I, I'm, I've yet to be convinced. What's the cost comparison? So no one has explained to me what these things cost. I, I don't 
no. So if, if someone at the company or if someone is using them to tell me what they paid, we could do that kind of comparison. But I have not been able to find out what they cost. I'll find out. I know a builder who uses them regularly now. Uses them regularly yeah. now? He's, we have to talk to this person. He is completely sold on it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Why? Um, well, his name's uh, Brad Stokes. He lives in Minnesota, and he just thinks that they're – the um, assembly is really easy, and there's fewer parts, and they're light to work with, and he feels like they perform very well, and he hasn't had any issues with them. What and he, he said that his uh, the crew that he you know his s- framer yeah that he works with uh, regularly it didn't take him a long time to figure out because that's one of the the factors. selling points yeah. is that it's similar. Well, a lot to- of people think it's going to require you know s- special expertise that that nobody's going to want to spend time learning and you know mm-hmm. but he says that's not the case so there you have it but but he hasn't done the math so <laughs> to compare it to you know yeah. rigid x uh, you know rigid foam or yeah, rigid the, mineral yeah. wall it's a it's a hard problem to solve right like because there are serious problems with exterior foam and mineral wool has like a, a serious uh embodied energy cost with it so you know like it's i don't know what to do mm-hmm. gutex so that's a very interesting uh Product, you want to tell listeners what what that is? I think we've talked about it a couple times. Yeah, so maybe a reminder is in order. Yeah, the wood fiber insulation, and I'm not totally sold on that either because I don't think they're counting. And we've talked about this previously. I don't know if they're counting um, the the carbon, the carbon, yeah, from everything else, and the fact that the you know the stump and everything is left in the ground, and that that tree would still be soaking up carbon if it right. weren't cut down. Right. So right. you know, it really depends on where that wood fiber is coming from, but. Anyway, I digress. I know it's, <laughs> it's a big These panel. are all questions that, I yeah. mean, if, if you're in, concerned about this stuff, like, it's somewhat overwhelming, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's hard to know what the right so, thing is. Right. Polyiso is probably pretty benign, you Especially know. Especially if you recycled. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the way to go. Mm-hmm. Seems like more and more people are going that way. I mean, and, and eventually, though, unfortunately, like, that supply will... That's uh, true. Again, it, it's going to either get more expensive or dry up, mm-hmm. right? Because if, if people are doing that, yeah. there's not going to be as much going around. All right. What was the question again? Uh, oh, yeah, the T-studs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he, he has a number of questions. Did we do the first one? Uh, okay, here we go. Number one, both add a certain level of complexity via non-traditional building techniques. This would probably be a crew-specific, but arguably a wash. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Uh, external insulation is inherently likely a better approach as it reduces the risk of the framing from uh, having condensation on it and thermal cycling. As long as Ag- it's thick enough. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Also a, a huge benefit of exterior insulation. Yep. Um, if we focus just on the cost, we should be able to compare the R value for a T-stud wall versus the traditional wall assembly with enough added external foam to match the T-stud. My guess is the external foam wins, but that's just a hunch. I think it's going to depend on where you are at because that's going to be how much foam you need mm-hmm. to keep the uh, sheathing above the dew point in the wintertime. Yeah. Right? Um, if someone started cranking these out for near the cost of traditional 2 by 6s or 2 by 8s do they start to make any more sense? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, but I don't see how that could possibly happen. I don't either, because it's like sawn wood is pretty easy to make. Yeah, and the more steps you add to the process, it just raises cost. Right. So like even just finger-jointed studs, if you just look at a finger-jointed stud, that costs generally, I don't know, twice as much as a regular stud. I've never seen those. I've heard of people using them, but I've never seen one. Yeah, I mean, I was just pricing them and I'm, I'm i've never used them myself i've seen them what do people do like, with those yeah what's the advantage of them i don't i mean i think that they're just supposed to be straighter it's sort mm-hmm. of like you know it would be like using an engineered stud okay which are extremely hard to nail into mm-hmm. <laughs> but they're just as easy to nail into as a regular stud but you know they're using the straightest pieces little shorter pieces of mm-hmm. of studs and gluing them together yeah and they don't have the built-in stresses of a long piece of wood right you're 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 breaking that up yep uh but they're a lot more expensive and the, than you can't studs. use them for structural applications, right? I mean, that's not. Yeah, I don't know exactly where you would be using them. I don't understand those at all. So, any of you have used those and like them or dislike I know Maria them? Maria or... has used them. I'll ask her why she uses them. Uh, there you have it. So, assuming production scales and costs do drop significantly, would Patrick ever be willing to admit that they might actually be a cool idea? Yeah. I love it. Unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> I do think they're a cool idea. I think they're a cool idea, too. I mean, but, like, every product has trade-offs, and I think there are some serious drawbacks to this. We know. What? 
what are they? What are the serious drawbacks other than the like, you got to train you got to retrain your framing crew. Mm-hmm. You need a, a a framing nail or they can shoot a four inch nail. Yeah. Um, I think you know people say the mechanical installation is not a big deal. I would want to build with them before I decided that was true because I can imagine there are things that come up that make it more complicated for plumbers and HVAC techs uh, to do their work. You think more rather than easier? I Brad I, said easier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the, they, you don't have to drill any holes. Yeah. Everything's already there. What if they cut one of those dowels? You, yeah, a, I mean, you can make a field repair for one, but you can't make a field repair for two. Yeah, he said why you'd would have to be, be going them? at it really aggressively to break those dowels. He said you yeah. could just stick a pencil in there to find out where they are. And, mm. you know. Well, and I mean, you can get them naked, right? Without yeah, the insulation. So then you just run that stuff. You don't cut anything. And then, and then you got to spray foam the whole freaking house. You don't have to spray foam it. What are you going to do instead? Dense pack. Okay, so I'm, I mean, I would warm up to that <laughs> idea, but you know, yeah. I think part of one of the selling points of this is you're using conventional bat installation, ins- insulation, which people like because it's cheap. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. Yeah, I think if you think beyond like what they're envisioning for it, then it starts to get more attractive. Who? Who's envisioning? If they're envisioning just using fiberglass bats, then. I think if you're like if you start to think about you know like dense pack cellulose and even dense pack fiberglass or something yeah. like that, then you it like becomes, this better. Then it becomes more attractive, yeah. Than you know spraying and spray foam. I like this product because it sparks endless conversation. <laughs> and there are and strong there are emotion. Strong right? emotions. There's two blog posts on uh, GBA, one of which I wrote, and uh, there's a lot of great discussion around it. If this, uh, what's this guy's name? If he's interested. See what so, oh, we'll so put lot, that up there. Yeah. Someone's got to be interested. Uh, Tom. Yeah. No, not Tom. Sorry. And a lot of the folks who weigh in Jay. have used them. So Jay that's... from Malvern, PA, what, okay. uh, is our most recent T stud questioner. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be more. <laughs> yeah. Do we have time for one more question, Jeff? Uh, sure. Yeah, we got lots. Oh, cool. So Tom from South Salem, New York, uh, wrote in. He said, I'm about 15 miles from your offices. My neighbor's backyard uh, is in is, Wil- is Wilton, Connecticut. My wife and I share a 2,000-square-foot 1984 deck house slash split, le- split level. Did you know what a deck house was? Did you ever heard this? No, I had to look. I had to look. Is, is it a thing? I mean, I looked at his house, and I thought, That's what okay. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think I understand what he's saying. It looks like... Uh, a house a whose house. square double. footage is mostly deck on the outside. Yeah, yeah. Double, de- double deck. <laughs> and it's got a, a basement living space that's uh, half of it is uh, below grade, right? So it's on mm. a sloping lot. And it's really the, cool. It's a very pretty home like and, and a, a very beautiful setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, my wife, okay, we, uh, the lower floor of which is half buried in a hill overlooking our streams and pond. We have a separate 1,200 square foot garage with in-law quarters, which also contains my workshop. I'm also a fine woodworking and fine gardening subscriber. Thank you for that, Tom. We have a cat and two young children in order of importance. (laughs) (laughs) My kind of guy. The house is two-by-four construction with cathedral ceilings, bad insulation, and a vented cedar roof. Half the basement is below grade, all on slab. The slab ends up four feet above grade where it comes out of the hill. The attached picture should help. It definitely does. Mm -hmm. So if you folks are curious how this house is shaped, that'll tell it all. Uh... Half the first floor level is exposed slab. The other half is relatively easy to get to. Snap lock plastic flooring from Belgium. Uh, I have a plumber I trust and thinking about installing warm board R or its ilk on the slab and getting rid of the baseboard radiators. So let's tackle that first. What is warm board? Well, the particular product that he's talking about is used in retrofit applications. It's basically to get you sort of in floor radiant without it actually going in. In the floor, I don't know, there are panels that you put down and you snap pecs into and then you run. And the panels are made from plywood and they have an aluminum layer on it that's meant to uh, help reflect the heat into the living space. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool product. Uh, They're not inexpensive, but uh, I think it's cool. Yep. Any problem with that, anyone? Anyone? Um, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, the first thing is the slab insulated below because heat will go toward cold. 
Only hot air rises. Like the heat <laughs> from this thing is not necessarily going to go up. Uh, right. So the aluminum helps with that, but right, it's not going to eliminate. It's not going to eliminate that potential problem. Aluminum is also a great conductor of heat, <laughs> and so it will take that heat and also radiate it. Pull it or, away. Yeah, conduct it to the wood and then down to the slab and down to the dirt below. Dig it. So if you've got uh, a lot of insulation underneath your slab, go for it. If you don't. Terrible idea. <laughs> and can you put insulation on top of the slab and then put these R panels on top of it? That is something I was starting to look at but hadn't gotten into at all. So the people you need to ask about that is warm board, right? And, yeah. and tell them what your situation is. But the, the real problem is if you don't have insulation under your slab, that's yeah. not mm -hmm. going to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, my concern there is then you're losing headspace. Because you're adding insulation mm -hmm. on top of the floor? Yeah. But the question, and it's a good question that he's going to ask, is, well, I already have baseboard radiation that's not on a potentially uninsulated slab. So what is, is it worse to have the tubing on the floor versus the baseboard radiators? Yeah, it would be because the baseboard radiators aren't in direct contact with the slab. They're not in the slab. And they're, they're convecting. They're getting they're, enough warm air. Yeah, it's a completely different kind of And they're co not covering the heating. entire surface. But, you know. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, it's basically just air is moving across that thing and convecting up. He might not know if he has an insula if the insulation so, yeah. slab. So, um, there is an easy way to find out to, if you have an insulated slab. <laughs> How? Do you a get hole. a drill a hole yeah. <laughs> and you see if there's foam in there. Mm -hmm. yep. It starts coming out as uh, sawdust if you hit the foam layer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just hope you don't, like, hit a water pipe in the, <laughs> under, running under the slab yeah. at the same time. Maybe there's already radiant under there. <laughs> Um, okay. So that's the story with the slab. Now on the, uh, second floor level, half of the underside of the joist base are, is already exposed and the other half is a dumpster away. Assuming I can get the ceiling and without getting divorced, install staple up onyx under the whole top floor pros and cons. So we had to look up onyx. I didn't know what that was. So that is a oxygen barrier PEX tubing. So his idea is to put and it's uh, not even PEX. It's like an EPDM. Oh, that's tubing. right. I'm sorry. You told yeah. me that already. They use it even in, like to like de-ice driveways and stuff like that. Hmm. So but what's also the advantage of the rubber versus polyethylene? I have no idea, except that maybe in outdoor applications, it's less likely to burst when it freezes. Okay. But this is speculative. That's totally speculative. <laughs> I have okay. no idea. <laughs> All right. Seems so like a good guess. Yeah. 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 Um, so that seems okay, right? Like, wh why not put the radiant floor under the, or the radiant tubing under the floor? I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, if the house is, like, really buttoned up tight and, like, you've got really good air sealing and really good insulation already, then, like, you're not going to have warm floors if that's what you're thinking. You're going to get out of He hates the radiators. Yeah. He yeah, says, he just I hates effing the hate the baseboard radiators. And I... Uh, I get that because mm -hmm. you can't put furnishing tight to the wall. Mm -hmm. um, they they're ugly. Yeah. Uh, inevitably, the cover falls off, and it's just like they're they're a, they're a hassle. Dust yeah. collectors too. Yeah. I would think that the time it takes to heat up would be a little longer with this system than with the baseboards. Oh, because you're heating way more mass. Because right. you're heating. Yeah. yeah. And the heat has to make it from the tubing through all the layers of flooring, your subfloor, your whatever else you've got on top of it. Yep. Before it's actually like sort of radiating heat up to you. And then it's there's also convection involved in that as well. So. <laughs> you're absolutely right. I was going to say that the single biggest thing you need to do is have someone come in and do an energy audit of this house, determine real heating loads, yeah. determine what kind of uh, air sealing work or uh, um, weatherization work can improve the performance in this house. And uh, you might need a lot less radiation than you presently have or think you need. Like all, any one of these conversations start with figuring out really – and that doesn't mean calling your plumber to give his, you know, rule of thumb sizing, but you need someone who's going to approach this with an engineering mindset and really figure out how much heating and cooling you need. Yeah. And then go from there. Same but I don't think there's an, anything inherently problematic about putting up the PEX tubing except uh, the potential for divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Unless that's what you're going for. I mean, it depends on what you're going for. Yeah. I mean, he already loves his cat more than he loves his kids. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful home. Uh, I, I think that's a cool project. So, 
Uh, thank you for your time. Your on-air validation would go a long way to clearing this with the missus. Uh, <laughs> she should trust someone else, too. <laughs> uh, boy, finally, um, we heard from uh, Kate from Montpelier. Um, she says, P.S., I had to chuckle when I read the tip on page 14 of Fine Home Building, uh, March 2020 issue, uh, number 289. Do you remember this tip? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she... Is she writing from the future? <laughs> <laughs> when I looked at the... I, so I had to look at the cover to see what issue this was. Uh -huh. And I was kind of shocked to learn it was March. And this we're, we're in like this second week of January. Uh -huh. yeah. So that's one of the intricacies. I feel like this same tip was in the, the, the most recent issue. It is this. That this is, is the, the newest okay. issue. Yeah. Issue. yeah. Yep. So uh, in, in, in this tip in the department, um, the, the tipster... <laughs> <laughs> who made, shall remain anonymous uh, <laughs> made, made this uh, holder for his plans out of uh, a PVC cap on a section of three inch PVC pipe with a, a female adapter and a screw plug in the end and you put your plans in there and it keeps them from getting destroyed in your truck and it's a great idea and it, it looks like a potato gun it, <laughs> we're getting to the to the to the, the, the whole thing here um this story linked below hit the news in our town about a month ago when a bomb squad was called in after someone found one of these on the roadside. <laughs> Upon further investigation, it was determined to hold the registration papers for a trailer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> don't lose this is the motto of the story or the bomb squad is going to come looking for you. Yeah. Just write not a bomb on the side. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think they like... Pulled up to this thing and had to x-ray it? I presume they did, right? That's what you do. You have to take this stuff seriously. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. they just rolled a robot out there. He yeah. Picks it up and shakes it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it does that, no, actually. No, probably not. Um, but I'm, I bet you that, like, someone had to come out on a special detail to check this thing out. Yep. Sweat some bullets. So if you want to see a picture of the tip and the uh, WCAX Channel 3 uh, Burlington, Vermont uh, news clip that highlighted this uh, scare, uh, you can see that on the podcast page. <laughs> Did you watch the clip? No. I didn't either, but I'm going to. Uh, do we have anything else? Do we have to talk about any events, Jeff? Uh, we, we're, we're, we're past the we're, we're builder, now, builder show, right? Correct, yes. That was fun, right? We're all the tired. Show. Oh, <laughs> man. We're all really tired. Speaking of the future. <laughs> uh, so thank you uh, all for listening. Oh, I don't have my outro today. You don't have it memorized? No. I don't blame you. Happy building. <laughs> <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> uh, and please like, comment, or review us however you listen. <laughs> there you go. That sounds familiar. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you all for joining me.